It's like it's clear. It's like it's obvious. Like, wait, come on, man. You just got forgiven. So you not going to extend that same forgiveness to somebody else? God has forgiven us a whole bunch of stuff. A whole bunch of stuff. We are going to have to learn to let things go. Because you're wondering why, man, people always treat me bad. Are you treating people bad? Man on the job, man, they always tripping, man, they always. Oh, you the one that's always tripping, bro? So everywhere you go, is, is the other people or is the issue actually you? You don't want to show mercy or grace to nobody? And you're wondering why you don't get mercy and grace back. We're going to go right into it. So we're going to be coming out of um, the book of Matthew, you guys. The book of Matthew, you can turn to it. And uh, we'll be coming out of Matthew chapter 5. And I'm just going to go ahead and read, and then we're going to we're gonna get this thing rolling. Starting in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for this sermon on the mount that you gave to your disciples, Lord God, and many others. And we get to look at it today. We get to analyze it, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, for your scriptures. Thank you for your truth, oh God. I ask that you would just have your way in this place, Lord God, from start to finish, decrease, this flesh in me, Lord God, fill me with your spirit. Have your way on tonight, Lord God. May this word be potent, O oh God. Let it have a sweet aroma, Lord God, in the sanctuary, Lord God. And let us leave differently than the way that we came. And let us be made better all because of your presence and your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. It's a nice message, you guys. Uh, last time I was up here, y'all, we had talked about the Beatitudes. And we're going to continue tonight and talk about some more Beatitudes. And I'm going to just do a, just a really quick uh, recap from last time when I was up here. So the title of the message, we had called it uh, to be or not to Beatitude. All right. And now, where did this to be or not to be come from? That was kind of my question. And it actually comes from Shakespeare's Hamlet, which the main character, Prince Hamlet, thinks about life, death, and suicide. He's thinking, um, his thinking in this play is called a, a soliloquy, all right? And in stage plays, it's because he is speaking his thoughts out loud on stage so we can know what he's thinking. And at this moment in the play, specifically, he wonders whether it might be preferable to commit suicide in his suffering and to leave behind the pain and agony associated with living. The first line and the most famous of the soliloquy raises the overarching question of the speech. He says, to be or not to be. That is to say, to live or to die. And we ask, to be or not to be attitude. To be attitude or not to be attitude? That is the question. The Beatitudes, y'all, the Beatitudes describe 
the blessedness of those who have certain qualities of experiences that are peculiar to those belonging to the kingdom of heaven. Child of God, understand and know you are a peculiar people. You're different. You're set apart. You've been set apart. You felt it since you was in school, since you was a little kid. You always was different. Why? Because you're chosen. Because you're his. You're different. And in the kingdom of heaven, there is an attitude. You know, the world has an attitude. Uh, in business, there's a business attitude. There's a sports attitude. There's a money attitude. Where in the kingdom of heaven, there is an attitude. And we would call it a B attitude. A B attitude. Now, in the Latin, it means bente son, or blessed are. Blessed in the Greek is uh, makarios, and we heard that it was called, meant that it would be happy, or happier, fortunate, well off. Are we calling the phrase supremely blessed? Supremely blessed. And that could mean that you are very well, excellently, with the highest rank blessed. That's you, child of God. You are supremely blessed. We also learned that there's also some Beatitudes actually in the Old Testament. If you think of back in Deuteronomy, the blessing and the curses in Deuteronomy 28, and then you know how it starts off, blessed shall thou be. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be coming in and going out. Blessed. There are Nine Beatitudes, though, y'all, in the book of Matthew. The last couple of times, we discussed the first one, which was blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about the poor in spirit. And we learned that it was not about our outward state. It was about our internal state. It didn't matter what was going on outside of our condition, whether it's up or down, uh, rich or poor. No, no matter what, on the inside, we're good. We're fine. It's just like when you're in a vehicle. We are all in vehicles right now. Your body is a vehicle, okay? Amen. Now, when you get in your car outside and you drive and you go about your day, when it's raining outside, you're not feeling the rain when you're inside the vehicle. It could be warm outside, but you could turn on the air on and not be exposed to the elements that's going on outside of the vehicle. Well, it's the same thing with us in this fleshly body. We don't have to be moved and, and carried this way, that way, by what's going on on the outside or our outside condition. We always could be good on the inside. Why? Because we got somebody riding on the inside of us. How do they say, Jesus take the will? Yeah. Jesus got the will to your vehicle. You, Amen? Amen? Also, we talked about they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we learned about the word uh, mourn, and that is to lament one, to grieve, to bewail, to feel guilt. But really what the scripture was specifically talking about was to mourn upon your own sin. And it's not mourning for the consequences of sin, but over the sin itself and how it has stained our soul. And when we get to that place of seeing our sin, how it had messed us up, how it has left a stain upon us, someone is going to come. You shall be comforted. And the Greek for comfort is uh, parakaleo. That means to comfort, to call to one side, call of, summon, to console, to encourage, and strengthen by consolation. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit does. When you feel and understand, man, I messed up. Yeah, that, 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 that was me. That was my bad. This, this is, ain't nobody else but me. The comforter is going to come in and comfort you. Amen? Amen? We also studied and looked at, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we learned about the word meek. And sometimes we could think that meekness may just mean somebody that's quiet, somebody that might be a little timid, a little shy. But we learned that meekness does not mean any of that. We saw that meekness is really about meekness toward God is that this position of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good. And therefore, without disputing or resisting. It's submission. That's what meekness is really all about. We're going to accept how God's going to deal with us. And we're going to say, you know what, God? It's, it's, it's good. We're going, I'm going to accept that. Meekness. We learned that Moses was meek. Numbers 12, 3. Now, the man Moses was very meek 
above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And Moses submitted to God. That's why Moses did so many great things. He was in complete full submission to God. Also, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, we learn that Jesus was meek. The meek is of, of, of the meekness of meek. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus was meek, and we know that he was meek, because even all the way up to the cross, when he was in the garden, when he was feeling that, that, that anxiety, he was feeling the, the pressure of about to take the sins of the world. He said, Lord, take this cup from it, but not my will. Your will be done. He said, look, I'm going to accept your dealings with me. And Jesus called it as good. Jesus was meek. We also learn about shall inherit. They shall inherit the earth. We learn that uh, to inherit is to receive a lot, receive by lot, to be an heir, to receive the portion assigned to you. How many people want us to receive the portion that is assigned to you? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And last time I was up here, we talked about blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we talked about that hunger. In the Greek, that is uh, penio. That means to suffer want, to be needy, to crave ardently, to seek with eager desire, or to be famished. And all of us know what it's like to be hungry, right? Exactly. We know when you're working and you're going about, then you get that little hunger pain, like, ooh, it's time to eat. Or if you don't get nothing to eat, you might get a little irritable. You might get a little impatient. You might be, be a, little, a little antsy because why? Because you're hungry. And we talked about how the whole world seems like they are all antsy or they are all impatient or they don't have no, no patience with people or they very agitated. Well, you know why? Because it's their hunger. They're hungry, but they're not hungry for food. They're hungry for something different, something called Jesus. That's what they're hungry for, but they don't even know it yet. And we talked about how they go about through life and we do different things and we think that we're getting full and we're being so, so full on all types of things. Remember we talked about you can eat a donut, but it really not going to fill you up. You might eat a salad, but that, that thing, you're going to burn that thing all the way out, right? Well, in this world, people are getting full off of so many different things, trying to get full, but never really truly attaining and really just staying, actually finding themselves empty. The world is hungry. The world is hungry. And they're full on the news. We talked about they full on work, careers, jobs, sports, family, full on all these things. But they really need to be full on God. We looked at a scripture that says, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. What that means is when you seek the Lord, a lack of good will not be in your life. Everything about your life will be good when we seek the Lord. Amen. We also talked about thirst in the Greek, dipsado. That means to painfully feel their want of, eagerly long for by those things that only the soul can be refreshed by. The world not just hungry, but they thirsty, right? And we see that the body can go only so long without food, but the body cannot go too long without water. It's, it's a great need. And we talked about last time how the world is hungry and thirsty, and you, the believer, you are a well to them. We have the living water, Amen. and it's living in us. We have the living water that they will never thirst again. And that living water is Christ, and that is what's living inside of you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, that was the recap, y'all. Now, we're going to get into tonight's verse, which is at verse number seven. And that verse says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, I had a, um, I sent it to, to Deacon Brett. I had a picture. I don't know if you got the picture. If you did, I don't know, maybe they could give me a thumbs up in the sound booth, maybe see if uh, they got it. Yeah, I mean, if y'all could put that picture up right quick, man. I just thought it was really, really interesting. Um, can y'all see that? Blessed are the merciful, Matthew, Matthew 5, 7. That's right there, right, right by my exit. I say, oh, man, all right. This is, this is really right on time. So if you need any more confirmation, the sign says it. It's right there. You need a sign? Look, bomb, right there. <laughs> all right? 
Blessed y'all are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, merciful, that word in the Greek is el e amon, el e amon, which is to actively be compassionate, full of pity, merciful, showing compassion. Also, we want to look at that word mercy. Just the word mercy in the Greek is el eos, which is kindness, our goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted, joined with a desire to help them. That's mercy. Another, another definition that you may have heard of in, in Christianity is mercy is to not receive what you actually deserve. Let me say it again. Mercy is to not receive what you actually deserve. Mm. Do you know what you actually deserve? If you don't know, I'm going to tell you. And if you get anything from this message, it's going to be Exactly right here at this point right here. And we're hitting it out the block early because it's saying it right there. Do you know what you actually deserve? Well, what do you mean, Deacon James? All of us, you and I, we actually deserve hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, we actually deserve that place. Well, how is that? Well, well, let's go back. We'll go back to what? Well, let's go back to Adam and Eve. They, they, they did something. They ate from the garden. They, they messed up. They dropped the ball. But that ball that they dropped actually passed down through all of humanity. Amen. All right? So when you come to earth, all right, when you are born, you are actually born in a deficit. You hadn't even done anything yet, but when you come into earth, when you, you're born, you're already messed up. And you'd be like, wait, wait, that, that kind of doesn't sound fair. I mean, I haven't even done anything, but you don't understand the line that you came through. You came in with a deficit, but you didn't even know it. Now, it seems like, man, that really doesn't kind of, kind of sound kind of fair, right? I mean, the child never did nothing. The child never even spoke yet. The child never, never, nothing yet. All right? So the child is already like, it's already going to go bad already? They just got here. Well, wait a minute. And then I began to think about it. I had did a, a funeral for a young brother. And the brother had sickle cell disease. That's what he died from. All right? And when I talked to the dad, man, and heard just the backstory and how everything kind of went on with the, the young brother's life. Uh, the dad had the sickle cell trait, but didn't have the disease. He was fine. The mama had the sickle cell trait, but she was fine. But that trait, through the blood, passed down to the son. And then the son got the disease. And in that funeral, I told everybody, that right there, and the father was a believer, and he wanted me to give them the gospel, and I'm going to do it right now, the same thing that I did there. What was passed down is the same thing that happened to all of us. It was passed down through our parent, and the parent before that, and the parent before that, and the parent before that. The child, the little dude, he never asked to be, to have sickle cell. He never asked for that. I'm sure he didn't because it's a very painful experience. Yes, he didn't ask to, to go through that, but that's what he had. He didn't ask for those parents to have that, but that's what he had. You came, you never asked to, <laughs> for, for you to have sin, but that's what you had. Then that's what we actually deserve. But here's the thing. God seeing that, he does something about this. He does something about this. He takes care of this situation because it really, 
Well, it it kind of seems unfair because, I mean, I didn't have even done anything yet. And God could see that. He see that, oh, yeah, Adam and Eve, they messed up, but don't we going to let this play out because I am going to fix this. And it's going to benefit them when I come in and I fix this. Because we are on this side at a, at a deficit. And then if you understand children, you watch children grow, you don't have to teach them how to sin. They just going to just do it, which shows us how it's in there. You ain't got to teach a child to lie if they're going to just do it. You don't have to teach a child to steal. They will just take the candy. They're, gonna, they're not going to ask. They're going to take it. It's, so that shows us, yeah, there's something in us, y'all. There's a sin nature that is embodied in us because it was passed down through Adam and Eve. So that, that problem is there. We can't deny that there's a problem. But God does something, okay? And we called it the cross. What's so amazing about the cross, though, when you look at the, the expression of, of it being stretched out, you got, you got a, two sides going on here, okay? And you have all of mankind on this side, sinners, Filthy rags, messed up, toe up from the flow up. We got all this sin, okay? And now we have on the other side, we have Christ, sinless. Sinless, no sin, Amen. completely righteous, not a stain upon him at all, completely perfect. And he says, I want to I give something to you in exchange for what you have. I want to give you my righteousness. I'm going to give that to you, but you, I'm, and I'm going to take your unrighteousness. There's going to be an exchange at the cross. And with that exchange, God, Jesus, takes on all of our sins and trades it, and we get complete, like we made an A on the test, but obviously we did not, we, we failed the test. But now we actually get not just an eight, we get a hundred. And, and we didn't have to take this. We're just exchanging. We're exchanging. It's mercy that he did. That was mercy. Because we didn't have to get that. <laughs> we didn't have to get that. That was mercy. That was mercy. And grace. Grace is to receive what you do not deserve. Back to mercy. Mercy is, is to not receive what you actually deserve. Grace is to receive what you do not deserve. So you're giving a clean slate, but you actually did wrong. It's you on the tape. You took it. Your hand was in a cookie jar. It's you. There's no denying it. But Christ is going to come in and, and, and take that and be as if you had never done it, as if it had never happened. He washes the sins completely all away. As red as scarlet, he's going to make them white as snow. He just does that. That's something we don't deserve that. We don't deserve that. But he does it. But he does it. And he does something else to, the, to our heart. Because, see, you could hear the gospel and you don't, have, you don't have to come to church again. Once you get the gospel and you get it, you ain't got to come to church. No, because the, the, the purpose is about the, your soul, of you getting saved. All right? But what's going to happen when a person believes? Because all you got to do is believe this to receive this. All you got to do is believe it. That's it. That's all. It's just believe it. Well, then when you will be like, well, well, yeah, they got to go to church. No, they don't. They don't have to. Where am I going with that? No, because they, they don't have to go to church. They just got to get the gospel. Amen. Now, the thing about the gospel and the thing about belief, belief does something to the soul of a person. Because, see, there's a compass in our heart. And our default compass is to the world before Christ. It's to the world. But then when we understand this gospel and then we believe that, yeah, Jesus really did die and he's trading in I get to get his righteousness, and I just got to give him my unrighteousness. And when you believe this thing, all you got to do is believe it. Something happens to the compass of your heart. The things that you used to do, you just, you just kind of can't really do no more. You don't understand why. And then the compass begins to pull you this way, where it's like, I, I, I feel like I should go to church. I, yeah, I, I'm going to go this Sunday. I'm going to check it out. And then 
You know, I heard they got a Bible study. I'm, I'm gonna check out the Bible study. I'm gonna go in, and then now you find yourself. And then, then now you now, now you're, you're 14 years in, and now we we over here and we're doing worship things and we going across the country. What happened? The Lord, He changed the compass of the heart. That's what He does. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's Psalm 103.8. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, it's going to confirm all what we were just talking about. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Christ is looking at, 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 or looking at what he created and saying, I got to go there and fix this, okay? And he puts upon flesh. And it made me think about him being the creator, right? It made me think about, we're going back to a car again, all right? But could you picture a person designing a car? They design it, they do that. They do the specs, they, they bespoke it out. The designer gets this car built. Wouldn't it be kind of strange that the creator or the designer of that car never test drives the car or never tries it for himself? No. I'm pretty sure Elon Musk tried his Tesla. He tried the Cybertruck. He, he, I'm, I'm certain that he went and test drive and tried out. Let's see how this design feels. Let's see how it works. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. He built mankind and then he said, you know what? I need to get in there. I need to see what it feels like. I need to know what it's like to feel them. So I could get a better understanding of why I'm about to give them all this mercy. I'm about to give them all this grace. Let me get inside that vehicle and see what it's like. It behooved them to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful. See that? A merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To do what? To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. It's why he did that. He wanted to make it right because that was a problem. I got to reconcile them because right now if I don't fix it, I'm not going to have any part with them. Because in God, there's no sin. He can't be around it. So how can we be around God? How we can now? Because when God looks at us, he don't see us no more. He sees his son, Jesus. He sees Jesus now. Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. So now we're talking about forgiveness, but mercy and forgiveness, they go hand, they like, they, they tight. They, they're very, very, very the same. Very the same. Isaiah 30, 18 through 19, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. The Lord is waiting to be good to you. He's, he wants to be gracious unto you. He's waiting to do it. Therefore, will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? When it means exalted, he's waiting to, he wants to rise up and give you grace and mercy. If God were to be asleep, which he doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber, so he don't sleep, but if he did sleep, it'd be like him every day waking up, let me find Deacon Carl so I can come bring him some grace and mercy. Let me find him. Let me find him so I could give him some grace and mercy. There would be God waking up to go do that. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Just wait on him. He got grace and mercy coming for you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to come down and I want to talk about a story in the Bible, y'all. And I, I really love this story. And I actually had talked about it. Uh, it might have been like a year ago. But it's a, just a beautiful parable about mercy and forgiveness. And it comes out of Matthew 18. And just to kind of get us ready to where, where it's going to go. In Matthew 18, I'm just going to just read just a little bit. I'm going to skip a little around just to kind of get to the main point. In, ver in, in Matthew 18, it says, at the same time came the disciples into Jesus, saying, who is the greatest 
in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus called the little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I said, ooh, isn't that interesting the way Jesus responded to that? Because the disciples are asking, man, who are, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus is like, boy, can you, you can't even get in the house yet. Come on, brother. Unless you come in, even you got to come here like a little child to even enter in the kingdom of heaven. You're talking about being, who's going to be the greatest? You better come like this little one. You want to talk about the greatest. You ain't even getting in yet until you at least come in the door as a child. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Don't touch my little ones. That's what Christ is saying, man. He's not playing. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and go it into the mountains, and seeketh that which is astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiced more of that sheep, than of the ninety-nine which were not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He will protect them all, y'all. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Also, following or later on in the scriptures, again I say to you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And here's where we want to get to. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So seven times? So I'm thinking about this whole scenario and why is Peter asking this question? Because it seemed like I could just kind of see Peter just in the cut, just listening to Jesus and like, mm, especially when he got to the forgiveness part. Some things start to go back in Peter's mind, man. And I could see Peter coming up to Jesus. Jesus, look, when you was talking about them children, you know, man, that was real. When you say we got to come as some little ones, man, I was feeling you on that. That made a lot of sense, Jesus. I get you. And when you talk about if, if anybody should offend them little ones, a millstone on the head, this should be sunk into the depth of the sea. Jesus, I feel you. That was, that was, that was, that was good. And when you talk about the 99 sheep, oh, man, I, I felt you on that because I felt like I'm one of them 99 sheep. I feel like I'm one of the ones. I felt that. But Jesus, um... You were talking about that forgiveness stuff, and I'm, um, ah, uh, that, that dude, come on, man, he, he, he took my cold cup money, he, he, had, he got my skates, he got my basketball, he, he took my girl when I was a little kid, man, I, you want me to forgive him? Come on, Jesus, no, not like, I mean, how many times I got to forgive this brother? So that, that, that's Peter thinking, right? And then this is where we get a story from Jesus. And it's called the wicked servant. And then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And I know Peter like, oh, no. Sweet, right? <laughs> I lost count. Do you want me to do it at that many times? You can't be serious. No. And then Jesus break down this parable, and it says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king. 
And if you look in the, in the, in the Gospels, there's several times where Jesus is going to say the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that because he has to use earthly things for us to understand the picture what heaven is like. So he says the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Now, when he's taking account, he means he's about to do some check and balances with his servants. He's he, he about to pull out the quick books and, and see what's, what's really coming in. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. And he like, he looking in the books and he like, ah, mm, bring him here. Bring him right now because that brother owed me, um, he owed me 10,000 talents. Now, when I say that right now, it really don't hold no weight. We're not, it's not holding no weight. What, what, what's 10,000 talents? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to do a little math. Y'all ready? We're about to do a little bit of math. I don't know, uh, Brent, if you could help me out with that math real quick. If you could put it on the screen. First off, 10,000 talents. Well, what is 10,000 talents? Well, based on the footnotes from the New Living Translation Bible, 10,000 talents equals 375 tons of silver. Now, we got a little weight. We got a little bit of weight on that one. But we need some, we need some dollar bill numbers, though. So we're going to figure it out. Now, next, we need to figure out, all right, okay, XX amount per troy ounce. Phil, I'm going to need your help. If you're back there, I might need you to go to Trading View and tell me what is... Silver per ounce, like right now at this very moment. $45? $25. Okay, $25. Good. That's what I had last night, so it looked like it stayed at the same price. So, $25 per ounce. All right. Now, we need to figure out how many ounces are in a ton, which is, I'm glad you asked, 29,166 Troy ounces is in a ton. Why they call it Troy? I ain't researched that yet. Y'all can find that out on your own, but it's called Troy. I don't know why, but they call it Troy. Now, the formula is going to be, you're going to take that 29,166 Troy ounces times the 375 tons of silver times the $25 per ounce of silver. And the number that we get I hope y'all have it. I don't know if I, if I gave it. Yes. Oh, there we go. 273,431,250 dollars. That's how much that brother owed that ball. So that that now now we got some weight on the matter. <laughs> now we like ooh. That's you might as well say it's 300 million dollars. You might as well. I mean, it was another 25 million. <laughs> you just just round it up. All right. Because it's probably more with interest, so it's probably $300 million. Yes, now let's read it again with that. And when he had began to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him $300 million. My God. But for as much as he had not to pay. He, he, hey, boy, he ain't have it. Mm -mm. Oh, no. Ain't no way. Ain't, 300 million, he ain't got it. Nope. His Lord commanded him, one, to be sold. Also, his wife, to be sold. His children, to be sold. And all that he had, to be sold. And guess what? And payment to be made. Whoa, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up. So they're about to sell him. They're going to sell his wife, going to sell his kids, sell all his stuff, and it sounds like all that selling still not going to make $300 million. And he still got to make the difference, make the payment. But how are you going to make the payment if he sold? <laughs> he ain't going to make the payment. Pay pay this, is, this is a conundrum. This is a very bad situation that he can't get himself out of. This is a big problem. Now, the servant, therefore, Fell down. Oh, yeah, he, he, he should be weak in the knees, right? He should be weak. He really should, man, because you're about to lose it all, man. Your family, you, your stuff, 
and you still ain't gonna be able to pay for it at the end of the day. You better do something. So what did he do? Man, he fell down. He weakened it, he fell down, and he did what? And he worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Ball, you lie. You can't pay them all. You, no, you not It's just, the, it, you ain't had it. You ain't going to have it. it, it just, it's just, no, no, no. He ain't got it, y'all. No, no. Now, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. He was moved and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So the, the, the Lord, the, 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 the king is like, you made me mad, bro, because that's $300 million that I'm not going to get back at all. But you, you, you're spitting all on my flow. And can, sir, can y'all clean them up? Get them up, get them up. Look, it's, you know what? You ain't going to better pay me anyway. So you're free. You're free. Not only is he free, but his wife is now free. His children are now free. He gets to keep his stuff. And guess what? The $300 million is gone. Like it, It's been wiped away. Anybody want they, some zero uh, out in their in the accounts on, on their, 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 their uh, student loans? Uh, zero it out on the mortgage. Uh, let's zero out on, on the car notes. Lord, zero it out, Lord. <laughs> you understand? So the servant wipes the clay sling. Clean slate, all right? Forgave him the debt. Verse 28. Here's the but. But the same servant went out and found. I'm going to stop just on just that part. He went out and found. Now, when I think about, you know, when you go to find something, that means that you, you found it, which means that you were searching. So you immediately you got set free, and then you began to go search and hunt for somebody. But why? <laughs> you were just... You got a clean sight, bro. What are you? What are you? What are you running to go search for? And he found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now, again, that does not hold any weight in today's grammar. So, how much is a hundred pence? Did I did I send it? I don't know if I sent it to him. But I'm gonna tell y'all, it's two hundred and thirty-seven dollars. That's like two days' wage, yes, you can say. So, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him $237. And the dude laid hands on him. He grabbed him. Not only did he lay hands on him, he took him. We got the same, we got the same. We in the King James? We are in the King James. Took him by the throat. Come give me, give me, give me the $237. No. Wait, what? Saying, pay me what thou owest me. My God. And his fellow servant did what? Fell down. Fell down where? At his feet. And besought him, saying, Bruh, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he was telling the truth. <laughs> the dude that told the king, said he was going to pay them all. He couldn't pay them all. He didn't have $300 million. But this dude right here, he probably could definitely pay him back. It was just $237, which is just two days of work. He could have paid him back. He could have pay, definitely paid him back. But he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Wait. How are you going to... Well, he in prison, dog. How are you going to pay the debt if he in prison? He can't pay you no money. But you're telling him, you're going to put him in prison until you pay the debt. So you can't get out until you pay the debt, but he in prison. I don't know how this is going to work, bro. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Here's the revelation 
you are being reported. Our actions are reported. When we don't show mercy, it's getting reported. When we don't, we, we don't show that grace towards a person, it's being reported. It, it, eyes are watching. And there may be physical eyes that may be watching, they may see that that go down, but there's some other eyes that's watching, man. They went and tell. <laughs> then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. I, Lord, I, I clean your slate of $300 million dollars And I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. You fell down on your knees and was slobbering and, and snot coming out your nose and all that because you knew you was in a bad situation. You knew you, you were stuck. And I forgave you. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? It's like it's clear. It's like it's obvious. Like, wait, come on, man. You just got forgiven. But you're not going to extend that same forgiveness to somebody else. God has forgiven us a whole bunch of stuff. A whole bunch of stuff. We are going to have to learn to let things go. Because you're wondering why, man, people always treat me bad. Are you treating people bad? Man, on the job, man, they always tripping, man. They always... Oh, you the one that's always tripping? No. So everywhere you go, is, is the other people or is the issue actually you? You don't want to show mercy or grace to nobody? And you're wondering why you don't get mercy and grace back. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. That boy is going to be tormented for a long time because he ain't touching that 300 million. He ain't never going to get to it. And Jesus says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. When you don't show mercy, man, you're hurting your own self. You're hurting your own self. And I know us as a people, y'all, we, 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 we could be so unmerciful. I see it sometimes even on trucks. They'll, they'll have that show no, no mercy, no mercy, no mercy. But you know what you're saying? You know what you're getting yourself into with God with that, with that mentality, with that mindset, no mercy? God can't give you no mercy. He can't. He can't give you no mercy. Now, it made me think about in Proverbs where it says, 1824, a man that had friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. So if you have to show yourself as a friend to have friends, you also have to show mercy to have mercy. You got to show that. You don't have to. You know, you know some people, they're not married because they don't show mercy. Like, oh, like you waiting for like the most perfect person. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to find that perfect person. I mean, you're going to have to be married to Jesus. And if that's the road that you want to take, that's fine, because that's the only perfect one you're going to find. Because in marriage, you're going you to have to show some mercy. Ooh, mercy. Mercy, mercy me. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, for real, we have to. So you wonder, why, why? I can't. Man, are you being too hard? Well, you wonder why you're not getting that promotion? You're not showing nobody no grace on the job, man. You're so hardcore. You're so like, like you, 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 you're not round. Like you're just square. It just got to be like, come on, there's no grace. You're not trying to give nobody no grace so they can't make you a leader because the way you're dealing with people. We have to watch how we deal with people, y'all. It's so important. We got to deal with people the right way. And y'all, we could mess up some relationships with our children because we're not being merciful with our children. And I know, look, we come from a time where parents, they, it, was, it was hard, man, but they was, it, was, it was too hard. And it's crazy how we could be so either not hard at all or we just all the way over here. And it's just like, I dare you to breathe. You better not breathe. Don't you? Don't. It's like, dude, like, 
You know what I'm saying? So the child grew up like this, and the child is kind of like messed up, and then they carry that, and guess what? It gets passed on and passed on and passed on. And we all dealing with that stuff. We got to be more merciful. Now, showing mercy, I have to put a caveat, when showing mercy um, is not, I have to say this, it is not allowing yourself to be constantly physically abused. I have to put that there, right? Because there's some bad situations out there, and I don't want you to take this message and go back to a very uh, a, a dangerous situation and think that you're going to continue to apply mercy to that person and show that person mercy. No, that person don't need mercy. That person need counseling. That's what it is. That's what they need. If, even if it's verbal abuse, they don't need no more, no. Because I'm sure you gave them mercy before, but if it's a constant, constant, constant thing, no. We need counseling. I, I think the entire black community, I think we all need counseling. I think we really do. Because we all have been through some stuff. And if we ain't been through, our parents been, been through, or somebody around us has been through it, like, 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 I think we all need some counseling. I'm just, I'm just saying, man. And in, I also have to say this, any constant sexual abuse, that got to, uh-uh. It's not showing mercy. No, 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 no. That's a problem. Get some help. Get to, get, the counselor needs to, be, needs to come in and that. You know, some people going to have to get called. Child of God. Little children of God. If anybody is touching you, you tell somebody. Please tell somebody. Tell some, you got to tell somebody. If not in your family, maybe somebody at church, find a deaconess. Look, we're not, we're not playing with that. No, not ours. None of our, no, 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 no way. So we got to show mercy, y'all. And when we show that mercy, we're going to obtain mercy. And that obtain means you're going to be met with mercy. You're going to attain mercy. You will, mercy will be reached out to you. You will acquire mercy. You will receive mercy. You will receive help from God. He is going to give you Mercy. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, we wrapping up. A generous soul will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. When we do it right, it'll, it'll come back. Yes, sir. It'll absolutely come back. God blesses those people who are merciful. They will be treated with mercy. The Elkhart commentary said, there is no motive to mercy is so constraining as the feeling that we ourselves needed it and have found it. You give out that mercy because you know how much you need it. All right? That's how we distribute mercy unto people. And then the last thing, well, you did this last time when I was up here, the alternate reality of the scripture. If we were to switch up the words a little bit, and see what, the, what the, the paradox, what the other side of the table of that blessed are those who are merciful. The other side of that would be cursed are the unmerciful, for they shall not obtain mercy. That's not what we want to be. That's not how we want to roll. Our beatitudes, the attitudes of the kingdom, the attitudes of what, how we must carry ourselves among the other people in this world to what? To draw them in, man. When they see us operating this way, they're going to ask you, why you, why you, why you did that for me? I, you didn't have to do that. Yeah, but, but I did that because I love you and, I, and you needed that. I saw. Do that on their job. They're not going to expect it, y'all. Kindness and mercy is something that is so lacking in this world, so when you do it, it's going to be a breath of fresh air. And they're going to remember you for that. And it's going to take you into some great places. I promise you that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wrapping up, you guys. I thought about Jesus in that moment when he took upon the sins of the world. When he did that, he took upon all of our sins and he was on that cross. There's something that he said when he was on that cross. Y'all could, uh, yeah. There's something that he said when he was on that cross, when he was bleeding out, 
in anguish, in pain, suffering for all of the sins of all of mankind, for every person that will ever exist then and now and in the future. Amen. He's taking the sins of not only just the whole world, but every generation of the world. He's taking it, right? And he says something on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I, and when you think about that, this is how Jesus was able to rise again from the grave. He had to say this statement. He had to, it had to be said. Because if he would have just took the sins of the world, it would have just stayed on him. Because God is looking at him not like Jesus no more. God is looking at him as, as, as us. And all the wrath of God is coming upon Jesus right now. And he is feeling it. He's feeling all of the wrath, all of the pain. He's feeling all of the anger. He's feeling every sin, all of it. Not just physically, y'all, but mentally, I'm pretty sure. Okay? He's feeling all of that. And in the midst of, of, of being totally human now, because he's feeling the pain, he's feeling the anguish, he says something that only God could say. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the midst of being in pain, he showed mercy. And him showing that mercy, I believe, that's why he was able to rise again and come back and not just die and, we, and never be seen again. No, no, no. That statement said something. That, because, because, when you give mercy, you receive mercy. So you receive the mercy to come back. <laughs> you receive the mercy to come back. And that's what we believe in, man. That gospel right there. So if there's anybody here that, that you never heard this before, you don't know what the fuss is all about, just know and understand, Jesus died for you. He died for every sin. Every ill thing that you ever said, done, talked, went, all that. He knows about it. But he wants to exchange something with you. He wants to take all of your transgressions and give you all of his righteousness. It's, a, it's an exchange that's not even, it's not even, it's not even fair because you don't even deserve it, but he still wants to do it because he wants to fix what happened back in the garden. And he wants to make your life better. That's why you're going through the issues that you're going with because you don't have him. He's the equalizer. He's going to set things in balance in your life. And all it takes is for you just to believe, and that's it. All you got to do is believe. It's very simple. People think that they don't know how to have faith. Yes, you do. You're sitting on a chair right now. You're thinking that's going to hold you up. You're believing that it will. We hop on airplanes, and we get on a plane that's a can with some wings on it with two engines, and we trust the pilot is going to take us with our life and bring us there safely, and we don't ask for his certificate. We don't go, go check nothing about that person. We don't even know him, but we trust him with our life. Trust God. You can. You can. So we could all stand, and we're just going to pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you most of all for your mercy that you show towards us. We ask that you would... Forgive us of our sins, oh God. If there's anybody here that don't know you, just in the spirit, Lord God, you know them. You know them, and you know all about them, Lord God. Saints, just repeat after me. Say, Lord, Lord we, thank we thank you. I thank you, I thank you for, your for your forgiveness that you want to forgive me for all that I've done, even from a child until now. I need you, Lord God. I need your help for me to believe in this gospel. Make it real to me. Reveal it to me. Open my heart. Change the compass of my heart. And may it be set towards you. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Make him white as snow. I take your righteousness, Lord. 
and I give you my unrighteousness. Make me better than the way that I came in. I love you, Lord, and I thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, bless you people on tonight, Lord God. Give them travel and grace as they return home. And they return to home is better than the way they left it, Lord God. Cover their week, oh God. May their week truly be supremely blessed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Love y'all. Y'all be blessed.